The cry of the people was met with ruthless repression as the military waged a war of total elimination of all critics. Death squads operated with impunity during the three decades of army rule and 100,000 people died at the hands of the security forces. The violence has driven one million Guatemalans into exile. In this lugar is we can say that the area I come from has been militarized not recently but for years. Right in the middle of the small towns there are military bases there to control the population. And the soldiers there uh, have to know everything that's going on in the town. And the way that they control that area is that every small group of houses or every neighborhood has an official who's called the auxiliary mayor. To meet with the army every month in, in their base in the town in order to report on what's happening in the area. This is the militarization that we have in our area. That's the militarization that we have in our area. A comprehensive look at Guatemala on alternative views. It's kind of a strange thing about Guatemala. You don't see much of it in the American media. The networks ignore it pretty much, so most Americans don't realize what the nature of Guatemala is. The socioeconomic status, the political repression, the terrible political repression in Guatemala. You see a lot about South Africa and Argentina and El Salvador, but not Guatemala. Well, we're going to try to remedy some of that tonight on Alternative Views because we have some Guatemalans here with us. We have Arturo Arias, who is a research fellow at the Institute for Latin American Studies at the University of Texas. He just arrived very recently from Guatemala. And we also have Simon Perez, who is a poet. And he also is a, an Indian who has lived in the uh, not in Guatemala City, but in uh, um, the other areas of Guatemala where much more of the repression has taken place. And he's going to tell us not only about that, but about a lot of the prejudice, the racial prejudice to which the Indians are subjected. I might also mention that uh, Arturo it was uh, one of the script writers for the uh, screenplay El Norte, which you may have seen. And of course, our Interpreter is Marty Rumbaugh. Marty's also an expert in the area, so he'll be participating with us. Interspersed in our interview is a documentary about Guatemala from the Group for Mutual Support for Guatemala. Guatemala, one of the five Central American countries found to the south of Mexico, is known throughout the region for its stunning rural beauty, lush highlands and volcanoes, some still active. The highlands are populated by Indians that make up 55% of Guatemala's 8.5 million people. Guatemala's beauty is deceiving, however. Beneath the smoking volcanoes lies the most unequal land distribution in the region, with 2% of the population owning 78% of the land. In 1954, a CIA-backed coup ousted President Jacobo Arbenz when he attempted to redistribute land among the peasants. Since that time, Guatemala has been ruled by a series of military governments. Inequality of land tenure, the highest infant mortality rate in the region, and the fact that 85% of all children under five suffer from malnutrition, all combine to give rise to protest and an insurgent movement. <laughs> 
The cry of the people was met with ruthless repression as the military waged a war of total elimination of all critics. Death squads operated with impunity during the three decades of army rule, and 100,000 people died at the hands of the security forces. The violence has driven one million Guatemalans into exile. Here are refugee settlements in neighboring Mexico, where nearly 50,000 Guatemalans have fled in the last several years. Another method to quell rebellion is the use of kidnapping. 38,000 people have been disappeared in Guatemala, 8,000 more than Argentina. In June 1984, a group of family members of kidnapped victims joined together to protest the disappearance of their relatives and to bring to the attention of the world a situation that was virtually unknown internationally. The mutual support group, known by its Spanish acronym as GAM, became the only voice of dissent against the government with the worst human rights record in all of Latin America. Por favor, se pueden retirar. Pacíficamente no hay ningún problema. Please leave peacefully and there will be no problem. A group of people who have suffered the disappearances of a loved one, and we are here silently and peacefully. We aren't provoking anybody. I am a member of the mutual support group. I want to know where my son is. His name is Carlos Guillermo Ramirez Galvez, 18 years old. He was kidnapped by men who arrived in two cars, one with a license plate, one without. The cars belong to the Corps of Special Investigations, DIT, of the Guatemalan government. In 1986, however, you got a new civilian president, uh, uh, Vinicio Cerezo, and there's been at least a lot of talk in the American media that this has constituted a return to democracy in Guatemala, that there's no more political repression, civil war, etc. Is that an accurate picture of what's really going on in Guatemala today? No, I would not say that it is, and uh, I think that to think of democracy as simply electing somebody to office, uh, it's a simplistic view of democracy. We understand in Guatemala as a democracy a government that is truly representative of the majority of the people whom have chosen that government and that it will really be accountable to that majority of its period in government and that it is a government that is also linked with uh, economic uh, benefits for the majority of the Guatemalan people and that responds to the needs of all the different sectors of the Guatemalan people. For us, democracy is not just elections, but rather elections are the tip of the iceberg of what democracy is supposed to be. And when you look at democracy this way, this is not what we find in Guatemala. In Guatemala, basically what we have found was a military dictatorship exhausted and exhausting itself after many years in power, after some of the worst years of brutal repression against the great majority of the Guatemalan people, uh, numbers of deaths and disappeared that astound the imagination. What are, what are some of these? Well, it has been mentioned in a country that is not quite 8 million people, roughly 114,000 people have been assassinated for political reasons since 1954. It is estimated that 40,000 of those happened alone in these early years of the 1980s when we had the two worst governments, those of General Romeo Lucas Garcia and General Efrain Rios Montt. And it is estimated that roughly 46,000 people disappeared in the same time frame. Now let's see, anybody good at math? What would that be the equivalent of in uh, United States terms if, they, if that same percentage of Americans were killed? Anybody ever figure that out? That'd be an enormous... Yeah, probably about 30 million, 30, 30 million people. 30 million, 30 million people. Killed in the United States. If the same percentage... In a civil struggle, yeah. That is, that's... Mm-hmm. That, that's... <laughs> that's, too, that's too high. That's really There's been that many people that have been displaced or dislocated by the war. One out of eight people have had to leave their homes or leave the country even or were assassinated or have disappeared, right. uh, which would be about 32 million. Yes, uh, the, the bishop of Guatemala estimates that of, of that same 
almost 8 million Guatemalans that we are, roughly a million and a half were displaced from their homes, from mm -hmm. their original homes, by the political violence and became refugees. Most of them uh, inside of Guatemala, probably as many as half a million made it outside. Most settled alongside the Mexican border, some trickled into the United States and Canada. Right. Eva Morales, soy guatemalteca. My name is Eva Morales. I'm Guatemalan. I'm 18 years old. How many family members did you lose? I lost, well, 16 were kidnapped and one was killed. What are their names? The first one, my uncle who was killed, was Moises Morales. He was 48 years old. His wife, Lillian Aida Morales, was 51 years old. My aunt was 44 years old. My uncle, 43 years old. My father, 45 years old. What's, what's his name? Rigoberto Morales. And then there's Salomon Morales, Elizabeth Morales, and Cipriana Ramirez de Morales. And then there's children. One is six years old, Damaris Marlene Morales, and another girl, uh, 11 years old, Avila Morales and a kid of 11 years old, Byron Morales, and there's teenagers also, 13, 14, and 15 years old. They are Claudia Roxana Morales, uh, Rafael Morales, Noe Salamon Morales, who's my brother, who's 18 years old, and Mayor Morales, who's 18 also. Do you have any idea who did all this? Yes. I know very well who did it because I, because I saw it. The secret police and sometimes the army helped. During the past decade, the University of San Carlos in Guatemala City has been the center of anti-government activity, therefore a prime target of army repression. Hundreds of students and dozens of professors have been kidnapped or murdered. Despite the threat of retaliation, student protests spilled out of the campus and onto the streets of Guatemala City, where they were joined by workers, peasants, and the unemployed. After years of rigid military rule, frustration is released as thousands clash with police in demonstrations protesting rising food prices. Street protests ended in more arrests and without concrete solutions. The mutual support group tried another approach, dialogue with the former Guatemalan leader, General Mejia Victores. We have done what you asked. You wanted a commission? We have started it. They didn't do anything at all. The commission presented three sheets of paper that contained absolutely nothing. We have invited the most critical organizations such as Amnesty International or America's Watch. They went to all those places. After 20 years of constant fighting between army and guerrillas, the time has come for peace. No, General, we're part of the people of Guatemala. We suffer and can't be silent. Our loved ones were kidnapped. Wouldn't you say something if a member of your family disappeared, General? I don't believe that you ever helped us because I'll never forget the body of Hector or Rosario or his son or brother. Four people have been taken from us in the cruelest way. We cannot forget that, Mr. Mejia Victoris. And if by saying this I risk my life, I don't care. My husband is gone already. I don't care if they take me too. During the height of the presidential election campaign, the first move in 30 years toward civilian rule, outgoing military leader General Mejia Victores is giving his last press conference before leaving office. Viene todo en inglés, pues,
It is all written in English and sent from Washington by one of these international totalitarian organizations, be it Amnesty International or America's Watch. They are the ones that tell the mutual support group what to do. They sent their instructions from Washington. Would you agree to an investigation of the military's involvement in human rights violations? I believe it would be a big mistake to do this. Because if it wasn't for the army, the guerrillas would have won and Guatemala would be a communist state. In the November elections, there were four major contenders. The most promising was Christian Democrat Vinicio Cerezo. The elections were widely considered to be free of fraud. Many assumed the military at this point was eager to hand over power or the appearance of power to a civilian government. The GAM also took advantage of the electoral climate to draw attention to their cause by occupying the cathedral in Guatemala City where they remained for five days. of violence by repressive forces. They claim to protect us, but they abuse their power to make crimes against us. Simon, you lived in the, what, the northern, northern uh, town of Guatemala, and you were in the area where a lot of this uh, repression was taking place, what it was like? Eh, la situación fue bastante difícil, ya que en la aldea, la pequeña aldea donde nosotros somos. The situation was rather harsh because in this small village, eh, se puede decir de que el 50% fue asesinado. ¿no? You can say that really 50% of the people were assassinated. Oh my God. Y, Uno puede estar viendo ya diariamente desde cuando es niño cadáveres en todas partes y se va acostumbrando al hecho, lo acostumbran a ver uno todo el tiempo lo que está sucediendo. And you can't become accustomed really to seeing corpses all over the place and, and get used to what's happening. De, la, la, la situación de violencia se puede decir también de que se dio con Bueno, son, fuimos parte de esa violencia, la familia de nosotros también. ¿no? And the situation of violence was something that our own family suffered as well. Y fue una, fue una, una violencia bastante cruel, ya que realmente es, la violencia la llevaban hacia los lugares más apartados de, de, la, de las ciudades. And it was a violence that was very cruel, which would occur in isolated areas of the city. Como, por ejemplo, nosotros estábamos bastante eh, internos en la montaña. And so when we were outside of the city, in the mountains, y ahí pues hacían lo que querían con la gente. Pues. Out there, the uh, government can do what it wants with the people. Eh, así fue como empezamos a sentir nosotros de nuestra propia familia, cómo era sentir ese dolor de perder un ser humano. And we ourselves in this family felt this pain of losing a human being. Y, Empezaron a asesinar al primer hermano en el 70, en el 76 desapareció otro que no sabemos todavía qué ha pasado con él. En 1970, mi oldest brother was asesinado. En 1976, mi segundo hermano fue desaparecido y todavía no sabemos qué pasó con él. ¿Hubo alguna razón que la población india en general fue en general, pero fueron selectivos en sus objetivos? Eh, en Guatemala hay, hay un delito muy grave que, que no se puede hablar de justicia, paz, libertad, todo. En Guatemala es considered uh, a fault to speak of things like justice or liberty. Eh, y, y también se puede decir de que el campesino en Guatemala 
es eh, su fuente de ingreso y su, su ilusión de toda la vida es tener un pedazo de tierra para trabajarlo. ¿no? And for the peasantry, for the campesinos in Guatemala, their source of income and their goal, their dream, is to have a piece of land and to work it. Y se ha dado cuenta de cómo el terrateniente, de que de, se llama el terrateniente imperialista que ha, se ha fundado en las áreas más ricas de Guatemala, empieza a extenderse y a poner alambres que los separa de esa tierra que ellos necesitan para trabajar. And they realize, of course, how the large landowners take more and more land in these richest areas of the countries and put wire between them and the land that they need to work. Y es ahí cuando eh, realmente el campesino empieza a protestar por esta injusticia ya que esa tierra anteriormente les ha pertenecido por generaciones y generaciones. And so people begin to protest the taking away of these lands that they had had to work for generations and generations. Pero cuando ellos eh, hacen esto, eh, su, eh, llevan el trámite de papelerías ya con personas de... Los terratenientes tienen el poder como el, el alcalde del pueblo, el gobernador, licenciado. O sea que ellos hacen su propia documentación y le, le, le quitan la tierra a cualquier persona. But when the Indians the, or the campesinos protest this land being taken away, well the landowners have access to the mayor, the governor, to lawyers, and with a, just shuffling of paperwork they're able to take the land away from whoever. These are the brothers of Nicholas Blake, a North American journalist who disappeared in the Guatemalan highlands. The government must tell us where he is. My son, Delfirio Israel Miranda Aguilar, was kidnapped from his house on March the 19th of 1982. Therefore, we are occupying this holy church. My husband, Isidro Lach, was kidnapped by armed men in the market of Santa Lucia, Cozumanguapa. I haven't heard from him since. I went to the garrison. They told me he had been taken by the G2 security police because he was politically active. They kidnapped my two younger brothers, Cesar Giovanni Carias Solares and Orlando Carias Solares. They were taken away in a car by two armed men. I'm asking for my husband. His name is Jose Alan Perez Avarado. He was captured by the Linces Battalion on November 18th of 1984. They had berets on when they took my son on December 17th. I went to the authorities looking for him because losing a child hurts so much. My son is not an animal to be led away. That hurts a lot. My son, Victor Manuel Monroy Gonzalez, was kidnapped by armed men in three Toyota pickup trucks. They threw him into a truck and one of them sat on top of him. We tried to follow the trucks but lost them. I'm looking for my brother Evelino Casemiro Valiente and my brother-in-law Fernando Najara y Najara. They were kidnapped by a group of masked men. They took him away in his underwear. He couldn't even dress himself. That's why we joined the mutual support group to fight for our loved ones. A ver si podemos, que con esta lucha podremos encontrar. Se llevaron tres ahijados y mi hijo de que andaba en seis años.
They kidnapped my three grandchildren and my 16-year-old son. I've been looking everywhere, but I have not found him. It will be one year since he disappeared. I'm fighting with the GAM to find my sister, Vicente Chicarín Ramirez, who was kidnapped. She went to the market with four bags of corn to sell in Mazatenango. On the way, in a little village called Belén, the army took her out of the bus and led her away. They kidnapped my son in 1983. He's the only son I have. In 1983, they took him from the house. He left four children behind. He's my only son. They surrounded the house. Later I went to the military garrison, but he wasn't there, they said. My son, Inocente Popel Chiquina High, was taken to the prison of San Andres Isapa by policemen. I've come there many times, but they say that he signed a paper and then was set free. Nothing else. <laughs> The peaceful occupation of the cathedral by the GAM was considered to be one of the boldest acts of open protest seen in Guatemala for many years. I just wanted to add in terms of your question about selective or massive repression that the army has alternatively used both. Sometimes uh, they have targeted individuals in a very selective repression process. For example, the process that Simon just described, say that a community leader emerges that considers the situation unjust, and he starts standing out for calling out for the rights of those peasants, then he might be targeted individually and disappeared. But then if the entire village rises up and start massively protesting or form an organization to defend their rights, then the army switches to massive repression and the entire village or an important sector of it might go, or that region for that matter. Uh, Simone has this militarization that Arturo was talking about, is that also occurred in your town? In those places, you can say that the area I come from has been militarized not recently but for years. Right in the middle of the small towns there are military bases there to control the population. Y los soldados pues tienen que tener información de todo lo que está sucediendo en la aldea y tienen que and the soldiers there uh, have to know everything that's going on in the town. Y cómo controlan ellos es de que cada pequeña cada pequeño barrio, o sea, pequeño grupo de casas tiene un representante que le llaman alcalde auxiliar. ¿no? And the way that they control that area is that every small group of houses or every neighborhood has an official who's called the auxiliary mayor. Que tiene que estarse reuniendo cada mes con el, en el pequeño destacamento para ver qué está sucediendo en las áreas. He has to meet with the army every month in, in their base in the town in order to report on what's happening in the area. Esa es la militarización que tenemos nosotros en esta área. And that's the that we have in our area. Well known as a human rights advocate and for his anti-military convictions, Cerezo takes power under the watchful eye of GAM, who will not forget the past. For those who were displaced and sometimes had to flee to other countries, or those who lost their loved ones, our homage and respect to those who suffered the most from the economic crisis, 
for those many nameless people who endured hunger, malnutrition, ignorance and unemployment. For all our brothers who bore the heaviest burden of deprivation so that others could prosper. For those who had to sacrifice so much in their homeland of abundance. With President Cerezo's rise to power, the pent-up storm of generations of landless peasants was released three months after he took office, as thousands marched for five days to reach the capital with their request for land to the new leader. Of all taboos in Guatemalan ruling circles, none has been more absolute than agrarian reform, and Benicio Cerezo has proved to be no exception. 2% of the population owns four-fifths of the land, which leaves less than 10% of the peasant population able to support their family's consumption needs. And is this sort of political repression still going on today under the Cerecio government, or is this sort of overt assassination and repression diminished? During the Cerezo government, we don't have yet documentation of massive repression of the worst scale as we knew in the 1981-83. Mm -hmm. But of selective repression, yes, there is clear-cut documentation that it's still going on. The Guatemalan Human Rights Commission documents over 400 uh, assassinations already. 453 now. 453 in the first 15 months in office of Cerezo's government. And we shouldn't forget that Vinicio Cerezo himself has acknowledged to Time Magazine that he only has 20% of real power in his hands, that most of the countryside is still ruled by the army. And the army has also been very explicit. They said it to Alan Nern, a U.S. journalist. They said it to Jean Marie Simon, Time correspondent in Guatemala until last year, that in the countryside they rule that Vinicio Cerezo's government is for the city folks, <laughs> but in the countryside they rule. So I imagine the, uh, the repression in the countryside either is, well, is probably still as great, either that they are still killing people or they have, quote, pacified it to a greater degree. Yeah, I would say right now we're in this stage of quote-unquote pacification. It's a vicious circle that goes on and off. I would say in this recent period, the latest upsurge of uh, massive movement of people happened from 1979 to 1981. The army's response was to massacre the great majority of those people. The bulk of the massacres began towards the end of 1981 through 1983, when 440 villages <coughs> were disappeared from the face of the Guatemalan highlands. And then after the end of 1983, all those survivors who remained were for the most part placed either in model villages, which is the name given to strategic hamlets, Vietnam style, in which the population is concentrated under direct army surveillance, or kept in existing villages or towns, but also under very thorough army surveillance. And that's the stage that has been going on since 1984, so that one of the major rave indications of the Indian people of Guatemala is to be let alone by, the, left alone by the army. They, they want the army off their backs and freedom of movement. You know, uh, we hear a lot sometimes about lack of freedom of movement in other countries, but in Guatemala, the Indians cannot freely move from one place to another without having to account for their acts to the army. Uh, nowadays, in 87, they no longer need to have a written permit as they did as late as 1984, but they still gotta explain verbally to the local uh, garrison where they're going and why and account for their actions and be ready to answer questions if there's any suspicion that they might have not done what they said they were going to that do. That sounds like the way the Israelis uh, control the Palestinians. In fact, uh, a lot of the type of population control that we have in the Western Highlands comes from Israeli advisors who spoke of experience emerges from the West Bank. From what we know, a lot of Israeli advisors who worked on the West Bank areas of Israel then worked in South Africa and then in Guatemala. And so Guatemala has assimilated and incorporated both the West Bank and South African experience in, in the process of population control. We shouldn't forget that the Guatemalan army has very, very close ties to the Israeli army. 
that it's all Israeli equipped. You don't see U.S. guns in Guatemala. They're all Israeli guns. Galil is the standard rifle. Uzi is the standard submachine gun. And that there are investments on the part of the Israeli uh, armaments industry in Guatemala through which already Galil bullets are being manufactured in Guatemala. Armor vehicles are being assembled in Guatemala. And there was even talk of going as far as manufacturing the Kefir planes in Guatemala, which eventually was blocked by the U.S. because that would compete uh, <laughs> with, with the Phantoms and F-5s. Benicio Cerezo's government saw another demonstration only days after the peasants besieged the capital as thousands took to the streets to commemorate International Workers' Day. The May 1st commemoration was the first in Guatemala since 1980 when dozens of workers were shot down in the streets by the army. The workers are calling for fair wages as well as protesting the disappearance of their colleagues. Some have called what has happened in Guatemala a holocaust. Benicio Cerezo represented hope for the future, but many Guatemalans are disappointed that he did not make significant changes within the security forces. The mutual support group is still seeking to prosecute past military leaders and have presented 1,500 cases to be investigated by a specially appointed judge. Between January and June, local newspapers reported 700 violent deaths, some with signs of torture. And the GOM reports the kidnappings continue. Students, intellectuals are being killed. We ask the government to stop the killings. Widows and children are left behind. What will happen to them? The only thing we want is bread, and what we are getting is bullets. Well, let's talk about what is happening in a more contemporary vein in Guatemala. Uh, I understand there was an enormous strike. I was reading a few things about it. I mean, thousands of people involved. Can you tell us about it? Well, it's uh, the largest strike in Guatemala's history, and which I think it's a uh, good enough testimony of the Guatemalan people's capacity to reorganize and resist despite the hardship that they've been through because as a result of all these massacres and all these things we've been talking about, all the existing labor unions have been virtually wiped out uh, by 1982-83. Nevertheless, as of 1984, the Coca-Cola workers went on strike for a whole year and that was able to breathe uh, the breathe new air, breathe new life to the uh, to the union movement, and now we have had the largest uh, worker strike in Guatemala history, where over 150,000 workers from both the uh, national and the private sector went on strike demanding better economic and living conditions. I think that you have read the last clippings uh, on that. Maybe you could add some information. Sure. The strike began with 130,000 uh, pr public sector workers who were government workers, essentially bureaucrats of one kind or another, electricians, uh, utility workers going on strike. And then they were shortly joined by another 70,000 workers from the private sector, representing another 40 labor unions joining into the strike. Uh, what happened was that they were able to cut off utility services to Guatemala City for a few days, and President Cerezo had to actually miss the first day of his scheduled visit to Washington, D.C., and including missing a dinner which was to be hosted by Senator Kennedy for him. So his negotiators met with the strikers that night and negotiated until near dawn, at which point the government essentially conceded all of their demands for a 30-day period. The agreement they reached bilaterally was that there will be 30 days of negotiations, and if no permanent agreement is reached by the end of that time, the strike will begin again incrementally. In addition, the 258 workers who have been fired have been reinstalled in their jobs. Those had, who had been threatened with firing are retained in their jobs. A document that's worker-produced rather than government-produced is the basis for negotiating. And most importantly, the legal character of labor union organizing is recognized during this time period. And that means theoretically that any company within Guatemala or any public agency within Guatemala is open to union organization during that time.
And that's absolutely unprecedented in Guatemala's history. There have always been companies like Dole, like Burlington, which uh, absolutely refuse to have union organization in their plants. So we've been really encouraging people who are in any way connected with trade union activity in the United States to send telegrams of congratulation to Vinicio Cerezo or to put ads in the Guatemala newspaper. First of all, uh, articulating congratulations for reaching this historic agreement, but secondly and very importantly asking that the agreement be respected and that these strikers' safety be guaranteed because in the past there have been massive strikes. There was a strike of 40,000 agricultural workers on the South Coast plantations for two months, which in theory the workers won. And they were striking for $5 a day wages. In theory they won $3.50 a day wages. But what happened was that the agreement wasn't respected and those who had led the strike were subsequently killed or disappeared. So if this is allowed to stand, it may bring about significant change in the labor union situ situation in Guatemala. If not, it may result in a lot of bloodshed. It seems like a contradiction here. We've had a history of so much repression, so many people killed, disappeared in the countryside as well as in the cities, and yet this enormous strike goes on and there seems to be some conciliation instead of just mass repression. Why the change? I, I think in part it's because the uh, government is extremely in need of foreign aid right now and the intention of Cerezo's visit to Washington was to get foreign aid. The day that he did come, he was able to, on that day, get five million dollars in funds scheduled for El Salvador, reallocated in an emergency way without any legislative process to helicopter parts for the Guatemalan army. And I feel like that need for foreign aid is an overriding concern right now and is the real equation that may have changed some since the early 1980s in, in the situation when those massacres mm -hmm. happened. So maybe yeah, the, the uh, uh, strike workers were very, and leaders are very astute, because mm -hmm. to schedule this when the president was going to the United States, because it would have been bad form for him to be in the United States and massacring the workers at the same time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and it's <laughs> very important also to link it to the fact that a lot of those unions have at least links with Western European unions. And uh, Western Europe, it's also outside of the United States, the major source of flow of foreign aid and private investment into Guatemala, and that Vinicio Cerezo has really been courting the Western European governments for aid into Guatemala and has traveled extensively through Western Europe. And uh, it would look very bad if after all that courting and after trying to guarantee and reiterate over and over again that the worst was over and that his was going to be a government, uh, a constitutional government where the rule of law would prevail over the military boot, that the first major worker strike violence was implemented as, as the means of, of confrontation. Mm -hmm. It would throw everything down uh, to the wastebasket, and it would guarantee that at least from Western Europe, that would be the end of any possibility of aid and, and flow of capital into, into Guatemala. So, so that link also, I think, has to be established. Yeah. We have begun to see limited violence as a result of the strike, too. Oh, yeah. it's, it's not really known the details, but Chiquimula, Santa Rosa, and Chimaltenango departments, all of which were areas, centers of the strike, have begun to receive reports of violence to the Human Rights Commission, and we don't have further details yet, but it hasn't been that massive violence which could have happened if these conditions weren't prevalent. Simon? Also speaking of the strike, one of the largest ever. It should be noted, too, that this is part of the general climate. One week before that happened, 5,000 campesinos took over one of the central parks of Guatemala City asking for land. And this group, uh, the called Pro Tierra group, is led by a priest named Andres Giron. Y dándose esta, esa toma del parque, está también que principia esta gran huelga. Entonces Vinicio Cerezo se siente, se siente bastante eh, acorralado por la situación que no ha dado ninguna respuesta hacia el pueblo. And uh, with this taking of the park happening right before the beginning of this large strike, Vinicio Cerezo must have felt somewhat uh, surrounded mm -hmm. by, and uh, <laughs> without any other recourse than to negotiate somehow with the people. Mm -hmm.
You see, from the logic of the army, I think that there's one thing that they understood and that they have expressed, which was that from, from their perspective, they won, quote unquote, the war against subversion, but they felt that what they had won militarily, they almost lose economically. And so they have come to understand that they cannot get a, literally get away with murder because of the high economic and political costs that they will have to pay internationally. They lose their foreign aid. They lose their foreign aid, condemnation from most countries, sanctions of different sorts, some countries break diplomatic relations, etc. And, and the cost for a country as weak economically as Guatemala is in a period of general recession is enormous. Mm -hmm. And so that has taught them a lesson too, and that has forced them to have to adapt themselves to this new constitutional period through which they wield still power and through which they do not authorize the structural changes that are absolutely basic to create a, a new, a real country to start with, but that they also give political margins that were uh, non-existent before, and which the Guatemalan people obviously always know and have had that creative capacity to take advantage of those little political spaces in order to reorganize and, and, and once again take the initiative in terms of political struggle. And the question is how long the army will remember this lesson, because Guatemala has been through several cycles of violence and calm. Uh, Simon's part of the countryside was massacred in 1965 through 67, and over 150 villages were bombed or napalmed out of existence during that time period. And then there was another period of calm, and, and resistance arose, repression arose. So the question is whether the army, given that they haven't given up their actual power in the country, will go any further than absolutely necessary to revitalize the Guatemalan economy with foreign aid, and then once again begin this sort of larger scale oppression or whether this is something that will last a while. Someone from the Human Rights Commission uh, of Guatemala, which is an independent agency monitoring human rights, as we said, uh, compared the situation to a house where all the appliances are turned on but the main switch is off and the army's hand is still on the switch at this point. No one's removed that uh, mm. hand from that lever. <laughs> Por el nudo en la garganta, por las bocas que no cantan, por el beso clandestino, por el verso censurado, por el joven exilado, por los nombres prohibidos, yo te nombro libertad. Por los golpes recibidos, por aquel que no resiste, por aquellos que se esconden, por el miedo que te tienen, por tus pasos que vigilan, por la forma en que te atacan, por los hijos que te matan, yo te nombro. Por los pueblos conquistados, por la gente cometida, por los hombres explotados, por los muertos en la hoguera. 
According to Alexander Coburn in In These Times, the intervention by the CIA over th 30 years ago has developed into a regime whose oppression is unequaled anywhere in the hemisphere. El Salvador, Chile, Argentina, Uruguay, they've all had their whores, but there's nothing that can compare with the suffering that the Guatemalan people have undergone in the last three decades, according to Coburn. Yet, the United States media during this time has completely closed their eyes to the suffering in Guatemala, in our own backyard south of Mexico, and there's been no exposés of the suffering of the oppression that the Guatemalan people have undergone the last three decades. In addition, according to Coburn, the media in the last year have created a fairy tale that things have changed under the first civilian government. Uh, Vinicio Cerezo was elected government, was elected president of Guatemala in January of 1986, and the media fostering the line of the Reagan administration has tried to make it appear that everything's okay now in Guatemala. Well, according to Coburn, the situation has not improved under the civilian president, President Vinicio Cerezo, and indeed the human rights record has even deteriorated. The Mutual Support Group, which is a Guatemalan human rights group, indicates that in 1987 and 1988, almost every month there were hundreds of killings and something like four people a day on the average have been assassinated by death squads in Guatemala since Cerezo has become uh, president. According to Coburn, the situation in the countryside is even worse. Indians are drafted into the military and forced to do military patrol duty, even though there's not any significant guerrilla activity in the countryside. And they've taken another 60,000 of the peasants that live in the countryside and brought them into what in the Vietnam era was called pacified hamlets. That is, they've forced people to leave their villages and brought them in to government-sponsored uh, and run villages where people are under the inspection and observation of the uh, army. Uh, moreover, freedom of the press has deteriorated. There's been political assassinations of journalists in which radio broadcasters are pulled out of the radio stations and assassinated. Newspaper journalists are assassinated in the streets of the town by death squads in spectacular fashion. All of this has kept the press from carrying out any critique of the Seracio, um government. In the Progressive for June 1988, which has an analysis by two of America's leading uh, radical press critics, Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky. And they talk to a great extent about not how the media in the United States distort and suppress information and why they do it. And they make a, po a good point of using Guatemala. They said that you, it would have been impossible for the U.S. government to carry out its uh, foreign policy supporting these repressive regimes in Guatemala if the press had provided the kind of coverage on Guatemala, truthfully, as it had on Andrei Sakharov and the Soviet Union, but it didn't because the, the media are part of the American power system and the media support the policy of the particular administration which is in power. And this goes right back from the very first after the 1954 coup which was engineered by the CIA and the United States supported the elite rule and even went to the extent of helping to organize the terror in Guatemala, which resulted in tens of thousands of deaths of people, still the media did not cover this. Hmm. In fact, Alexander Coburn and his associates did a study of the stories in the last year in the major American newspapers concerning Guatemala and found that there was almost nothing that our major newspapers in the United States the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Christian Science Monitor, etc., only had seven stories on Guatemala during this whole 12-month uh, uh, period at a time when there was intense focus on Central America because of the Arias uh, peace uh, plan. Moreover, of the seven stories on Guatemala, only one or two were really critical. A lot of them were sort of whitewashing the Cerezo uh, government
One story in the Christian uh, Science Monitor, for instance, sa said that things have significantly improved under Cerezo in uh, Guatemala, that many Guatemalans think that Cerezo deserves equal credit with the Costa Rican President uh, Oscar uh, Arias Sanchez for bringing peace to Central America. And only one or two of these stories covered the death squad activity in uh, Guatemala. There was one story by Stephen Kinzer in the New York Times in February of this uh, year that indicated that uh, Cerezo had not challenged the army that was still engaged in murder and death squad activities, that there had been uh, no prosecution of previous uh, atrocities by the uh, military, that no reforms had been covered out, and the political violence was on the uh, rise. But that's the only story in the mainstream press this whole year. There are other aspects of the story which the regular media absolutely avoid. One is the Israeli connection. Uh, Israel was Guatemala's principal international backer uh, between 1977 when the Carter administ administration cut off aid until January of 86 with the installation of uh, Vinicio Cerezo as the president. Uh, not only was Israel the primary arms merchant, it also installed computer surveillance equipment in Guatemala and under the pretext of providing agricultural assistance to help devise these uh, strategic hamlets a la Vietnam, uh, which have been so suppressive and so disruptive of the life in the countryside. And of course, uh, the uh, Mossad, the Israeli secret police, has been involved in a lot of the uh, torture and deaths that have been going on. In fact, the Israeli government has been the surrogate for the United States during the entire Reagan administration. Whenever a country like Guatemala or El Salvador's civil rights record is so bad that Congress uh, cuts backs on aid because of all the political murders and the death squads, et cetera, the U.S. calls on Israel to supply the governments in places like Guatemala and El Salvador with military aid, with police aid, and with other forms of economic aid when the U.S. Congress refuses to do so. This has been a constant pattern under the Reagan administration. There, there are frequently a lot of talk about the white mercenaries with the Contras in Nicaragua. The first story I've seen about the mercenaries, North American mercenaries being used in Guatemala. The Guardian says that they, they're, they're seen very frequently in Guatemala City. They apparently use that uh, capital as their, re -ba their rear base for their between tours of battle in Honduras and in Nicaragua. Guess they swing both ways. And in the bars in the city, they say that the groups of mercenaries can be found uh, very frequently, almost every night, as a matter of fact, sitting around uh, telling sea stories and about talking about how the people they've killed and how many women they've raped. And even several ex-Green Beret mercenaries have been uh, noted that uh, they were there and recognized as participating in this. And that's Alternative Views for this time. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.